Hey, I'm also pumped this morning because we're going to close out a series. We're going to finish a series we started three weeks ago called Audacious Prayer. And we prayed some pretty incredible prayers, man. What does it look like to really ask God to look at me, examine me? Where am I, God? Where do I need to be? Where do I need to go? God, embolden me. That's a brave prayer. And then last week we talked about, God, unite us. Uh, Aside from our differences, get us together on the same page behind your mission, your vision, Jesus. And today we're going to pray a really bold prayer. A prayer that a lot of us, man, we're a little bit afraid of because we don't know what that would do and what that would look like. And we're going to pray a prayer. We're going to look at a guy who prayed this prayer. God, use me. God, use me. Because in the Old Testament, God appeared to some people a few times and asked them if he could use them. He appeared to Moses. He said, Moses, I want to use you. And Moses said, well, God, I'm here, but send somebody else. And then he appeared later. He appeared to a guy named Isaiah. And Isaiah said, well, I'm here. You can send me. But we're going to look at an individual in the Old Testament today. God didn't appear to him. God didn't send him some burning bush, some miraculous vision. None of that happened. Instead, he got some bad news one day. God didn't need to say anything to him. When he heard the news, he realized, I'm here, and I can make a difference. So I'm praying that God would use me right where I am. I invite you to turn in your Bible to the book of Nehemiah. If you don't have a Bible with you, don't worry. We have it up for you on the screen. In the book of Nehemiah, verses 1 through 4, which we're not going to read, Nehemiah gets some terrible news. He's serving under King Artaxerxes and his home country. Now, he wasn't even born there, but he was from Jerusalem. His country of origin was a Hebrew nation. He was Hebrew by blood, but he was born in Babylon. And he knew of Jerusalem, and he had heard stories of it. And word had spread that Jerusalem, and it had been burnt to the ground. The walls had fallen down. There was nothing left. And he gets this terrible news sitting in a very comfortable position. He's a cupbearer to a king. He's a pretty well taken care of guy with a little bit of power, but not a whole lot. And he realizes, I could pray for God to fix this. I could pray for God to raise up somebody else to fix this. Or I could see what I could do right here where I am. And so would you read with me in Nehemiah chapter 1? We'll begin reading in verse 5. And I said, this is Nehemiah, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please yet let your ear be attentive And your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned. You notice how he didn't cast it off on everybody else? I find this a lot. A lot of us are really worried about America, but we're not the problem, okay? He prayed, we have issues, God, and I am part of it. I have sinned. He confesses, he says in verse 6, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. This isn't a one-time prayer. He's praying it over and over. Skip down to verse 7. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, or the ordinances which you command your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, The word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. This has come true. They are scattered. They are the diaspora. They are no longer centralized in their hometown, their homeland. They've been spread throughout civilization. Verse 9, but here's the beauty of that promise. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you are cast out to the furthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day. I pray, grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cupbearer. He doesn't go into great detail about what he's going to do in the prayer, but he says, God, I have an opportunity, and I need you to help me see it through. What he's going to do, he's going to approach the king, King Artaxerxes, and he's going to say, 
What I'd like for you to do is to send me back. Now, this is a capable leader in this man's court. He doesn't want to see capable leaders given to other projects. But he asks this king if he would send him to Jerusalem to help rebuild this wall, not just to help rebuild it, but if this king would help fund it, would help give him qualified leaders and connections. And this is something that should not work out. This would be like me or you going to our boss and saying, hey, um, my family's looking at starting a business. And we were thinking, maybe you could fund it, give us some time off, actually send us some of your more capable leaders, give us a little bit of a nest egg to get started. I think you and I both know what most of our bosses would say. Uh, get back to work, dude. What, what's wrong with you? No. A thousand times no. But he prays and says, God, give me favor. And I want you to understand what's at risk here. He's not just risking a no. Most of us, we get afraid of hearing a no. We get afraid of being turned down. This guy, if he gets told no, he could also be put to death. This is pretty bold stuff to ask a king. This king could say no, and what's wrong with you? Strip him of his title, strip him of his job. This guy needs to go to prison or worse, death. But Nehemiah, had, or Nehemiah has everything to lose, but his home country has everything to gain. And so he puts his neck out on the line for people who don't even know his name. And he says, God, be with me. God, use me. This morning, I want us to look at what it looks like for us to pray, God, use me. There are some important components to this prayer that he prays. He doesn't just kneel down and say, God, make me a miracle worker. Let my name be great. He says, no, God, I want to remind you. I know who you are. You are great. You are good. You are awesome. You are mighty. And we have messed up. He draws a comparison. He says, God, I know how good you are. And I know how badly we have acted. We have turned our back on you. The story of Israel is the story of humanity, okay? We look to God, we turn from God. We run to God, we run from God. It's a back and forth soap opera of turning to God and turning from God. And when we find this passage, they are away from God. But people's hearts are beginning to turn back from God. And isn't this just how a lot of us live our lives? There are seasons when we are close to God, we run to God, and then something happens or we get bored or we get tired or we get sidetracked. And our hearts, they don't turn completely from God, but we get away from him. And this is where we find Nehemiah and a group of people turning their hearts back to God. And he says, God, use me to do something that will bless others. It will bless people who don't even know me. And then he enters that room and he makes his request. Now, if you know the story of Nehemiah, you know it goes pretty well. The king not only sends him, but sends resources sends connections they can use to get lumber, to get walls built, to get things done that they needed to have done. This morning, am I encouraging you to be a Nehemiah and go to your boss? No, I'm saying this. Nehemiah found himself with a problem, and he realized he was part of the solution. He may be all of it, he may not be all of it, but he was going to do all that he could to make a difference. I'm convinced that in this room right now, we have a lot of difference makers. We get a lot of bad news at work. People around us get a lot of bad news, and we sit there and we wonder what to do, and we wonder what to say, and we pray, God, tell me what to do, show me what to do, and here's my encouragement to you. Here's what I want you to start praying. God, I pray you'd use me this week. Give me opportunities, and here's the truth. A lot of us, we have opportunities. There are people hurting around us. There are people going through some things that we've been through. They just got the word. Their husband, their wife is leaving them. They just got the word. Things are not working out with their kids in school like they hoped they would, like they thought they would, and we sit there and we wonder, and God's saying, you can make a difference. Make a difference and say something. Well, I don't want to be too spiritual. I don't want to be too Christian. We're afraid of getting a no. He could have lost his life. It's time we stop being afraid of no's and start saying, man, what if somebody says yes? You can make a difference. I can make a difference in someone's life, in someone around us. Not only the people we love that we see at Thanksgiving, but the people we work with, the people we live with, the people we do life with. God expects us to be making a difference. Well, how could God use me? In a numerous, a lot of different ways. See, a lot of us, we like to think this way. Well, if I'm inviting people to church, I'm doing my part. I'm glad you're inviting people to church. And Lord knows, I want you to invite people to church. We just got some new cards for people to invite people to church. And they say, be my guest this Sunday. That's great. But if you and I think that we're going to make a difference in our community, in our work, everywhere we go by just inviting people to church, we've missed it. 
Yes, I want them to come to church and hear about Jesus, but I want you to show them the love of Jesus on Tuesday. I want us to live it out in such a way that they are drawn, not to me, not to you, but to this Jesus that has transformed us, right? And so God uses us not just by inviting people to church, not just by telling them about Jesus, but by showing and living this life he's called us to. So he prays, God, I need you to forgive us where we failed you. This is where I believe we need to park for a minute. I think sometimes we jump right to God, use me, and God saying, hey, hold up. We need to deal with some stuff. This week, my wife, she, uh, she started getting Christmas stuff out. Now, I'm a big, you got to wait till after Thanksgiving to start Christmas stuff. That's my, that's my motto. It's my life, okay? I went to Home Depot, and they were already decorating. I said, what is wrong with you guys? You, this is not how it's supposed to be. Christmas music. I, don't, I love Christmas, but in its own time, okay? But she said, I want you to paint something on some palettes and, you know, and then I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll do that. Because I like painting. I used to paint a lot when I was younger. And so I pulled out my paintbrushes, and I brought them here to show you. Here's the thing about these paintbrushes. All these paintbrushes are different. I got a filbert. I got a circle brush. I got a fan brush. And I got this brush. I don't know what it is. But I know what they do, okay? Each of them does very different things with paint on them. And so if I'm starting from scratch, I'm going to grab the filbert, and I'm going to fill in some big areas. If I need to paint some trees, I'm going to grab that fan brush and put some branches on, all right? And I get my Bob Ross moments going, and I just have a good time, all right? That's not a mistake. That's a tree, right? And I have a good old time. But there's this thing. Like, I don't have that many brushes because I can't afford them. They're, like, really expensive for nice paint brushes. So what I have to do is I have to clean my brushes out a lot. And when I go to clean these brushes, it's a little bit of work because I do oil painting. And when you paint with oil... That oil gets into these brushes, and if you leave that oil, it'll ruin this brush. Now, this brush is uh, 13 years old. I had it a long time. Started paint when I was a teenager. And every time I clean this brush, I'm thorough. And here's why. If I leave paint in there, I can't use this brush anymore. Sometimes God has to continually be cleaning us so that he can use us we like to let things get caked up and clogged up and, well, we're not going to talk about that. I'm not going to think about that. And God's saying, no, we need to deal with this so I can use you. Now, don't get it twisted. If you get close to this brush, you know what you're going to see all over it? Stains. You're going to have stains in your life, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with you having a past that's checkered with mistakes. That's actually beautiful because God uses us no matter what our past is. It's when we refuse to let him clean out the brush. A lot of us get it twisted. There's this verse. I'm going to read it to you. This verse in uh, Ephesians. I want to read it to you real quick. It's in Ephesians chapter 3. I've actually preached on it before, but I love how it says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which were prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A lot of us think that because we're his craftsmanship, we're his workmanship, that we're the piece of art. No, 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 we're the tool. We were created to do good works. He's always using us. It's never finished. It's always cleaning us, preparing us, and using us. And here's the other beautiful thing, man. We're not all the same, right? God uses us in different ways. Lean into that. Nehemiah had a role, had a job in this thing he did. But there were thousands of other people doing important tasks on a daily basis. And when it came right down to it, they were looking out for each other while they were doing it together. This morning, I'm not saying you need to be like me. And I'm not saying I need to be like you. I'm saying lean into who you are and how God can use you. Some of you, God has uniquely gifted to be an encourager. Man, encourage people. Encourage them on Sunday. Encourage them on Monday. Encourage them on Tuesday. Some of you, God has uniquely, uniquely gifted you to be a leader, to lead people to Christ, or maybe to lead people in vision and mission of the church. Maybe God has given you the gift of serving. You just love serving. Lean into that. I'm not going to be you, and you're not going to be me. But if we are all allowing God to clean us, right, and make us useful and ready to be used. There's no telling what God could do. Here's the funny thing. When I started painting, I thought it was going to be very, very difficult, and it is. Don't get me wrong, but I went to my first class, and there was lots of people there who'd never painted before, and my art teacher, I love her today. Her, her name is Miss Janet. Miss Janet said, now listen, all of you are going to think 
my painting doesn't look good because you're looking at so-and-so's painting. But you're looking at their painting from your seat six feet away from their seat. Their painting looks better because you're six feet away, okay? But your painting is going to look just as good, so we'd start painting. And you know how long it takes to paint a painting? I had no idea. It was nine hours. Nine long hours. And here's the point. Lots of little strokes add up to one big, beautiful painting. Some of us pray this prayer, God, use me, and we think we're going to change the world on Tuesday. That's not how it works. That is not how it works. We think we're going to pray this prayer, God, God, help me to reach people, and we invite 10 friends to church, and only one of them show up, and we're like, well, I guess God didn't choose me to change the world. No, he sure did. You change the world for somebody, and then they change the world, and then we reach more people. It doesn't happen overnight. It's lots of little strokes put together, lots of little paint strokes, little brushes, little differences made here and there. I think some of us get too discouraged because we look at this whole thing. We say, oh, I can't do that. That's not your job. I don't use one brush to paint a painting. I don't use one color to paint a painting. I don't use one hour to paint a painting. It takes a lot of these things working together. Here's the beautiful part. God used Nehemiah right where he was, and it was not by accident that he was where he was. I believe what I'm about to say with all my heart. It's no accident that you're sitting where you sit this morning. It's no accident you work where you work. You know who you know. You say, Mark, I look back and I've made mistakes. I've done some crazy things. This is all just coincidence and random. It's not. God can use the mistakes you've made. He can use the wins, the successes you've had. But it's whether or not we allow him to use them. I think a lot of us are okay praying things like, God, examine me. God, give me boldness. God, help me to unite with others. But when we pray this prayer, we get a little bit nervous because we're afraid God's going to call us to China. God's going to call us to be more generous than we think we can afford to be. God's going to call us to say things that we're afraid might make us uncomfortable. And we lose out because of what could happen when the truth of the matter is, it's never like you think. We're always afraid of taking that risk. We're always afraid of being bold. We're always afraid of what it'll look like. And it never, never would be that way. So Nehemiah walked into that room. I'm sure his heart was in his throat. And I think once he started talking, like a part of his mind just said, it's just another day. The sun is outside that window. Your mouth is moving and words are coming out. We're going to get through this. It's going to happen. And they did. The words came out. He was not only given a yes, he was giving a resounding yes, and it made a difference. We don't have time to read the rest of the book or even the chapter. But in chapter 2, man, to see God's plan work together. I'm afraid many of us were a little bit cool with praying audacious prayers. We're a little bit cool with praying prayers. But when we talk about God using us, we say that's a little too far. No, God has always had it in his plan to use you. God has always had it in his plan to use your story, to use your life. When I was talking with the individuals getting baptized this morning, man, I loved hearing their stories, especially like thinking of, man, how their story was similar to mine. It's not about having a perfect story. It's about having my story and how Jesus transformed my story. And that resonates with somebody. Some of you, when that, when that all went down, some of you resonated with Matt. Some of you may have resonated with Corey. Man, you thought, yeah, or maybe even Colin. You got saved at a young age, but you've remembered. Man, I remember what it was like when I followed Christ. That's the point. God uses all of us in different ways to encourage, to equip, and to mentor other believers. So here's my question to you. Are you willing to pray, God, God, use me? And what does that look like? What if he does use you? What if he gives you a little bit of boldness like we've been praying about? What if he examines you and says, these are the things we need to strip away, and he starts cleaning you out like that paintbrush? I didn't tell you about what I use to clean my paintbrushes. It's called paint thinner, and it's nasty. It smells bad. It's pretty abrasive. I mean, it's rough. And when I put those brushes in there and I stir them around, it gets messy. That water, it looks like water. The paint thinner that's clear to begin with, it gets dirty and filthy, and there's all kinds of colors swimming around in there. I think a lot of us are afraid of that. We're afraid of opening up our mess for God to see it, but that's what God needs to do. He needs to see it, and he needs to let you know. He knows about it, and he forgives you, and he loves you. And we're going to get rid of all this, and we're going to leave that in that mess, and you pull that brush out, I like doing it with the fan brush because it's a little more dramatic. And you go like this, and it flies everywhere. 
And then I put it in a paper towel and it's ready to go. It says, what's next? Let's get to painting. Let's get to doing. Let's get to work. Hey, this morning, there's nothing in your past that God can't forgive. There's nothing in your past that God can't even use that part of your story to encourage and equip others. But it's when we refuse to let go of it. It's happened. I've done it. I'll get in a rush cleaning up. And I pulled out a paintbrush where I left the paint in there. There's no going back. I mean, it's, it's a mess. It's nasty. There's no painting with that paintbrush. We got to really do some work now if we're going to save that paintbrush. Don't hold on to stuff. Don't let your past hold you back from what God could do through you. And here's the true benefit, right? So Nehemiah, he starts doing this, and we think like, oh, great, all these benefits to all these people. Do you know how much of a benefit this was to Nehemiah to see God use him, to see God work in him? One of the questions we had in small group this week at my small group was, when do you feel closest to God? And different people have different answers for that question. Some of us feel closer to God when we're singing, you know? I love being around other believers. Some of us feel closer to God when we are all alone in our car and we're worshiping, or maybe you feel closest to God in nature when you're hiking, when you're running, or when you're camping or something like that. I don't know. But I started talking with some of them, and a lot of us came to this point where we realized, like, I feel closest to God when I feel like God is actually using me, and he doesn't just love me, but he loves using me. He loves using me in equipping others, in encouraging others, in changing lives around me. And here's my question to you. If that's the case, well, how do we do, how do we, what do we do to make that happen more? To constantly be in flux, in a place where God is using us. And this is what I said. I can think of places I was close to God. Like places where my prayer life was, that's where I really was close. But what always preceded those places or those times was a big risk that I took. When I took a risk by inviting someone to church and then I watched God not only give me a yes, but that person came and their life was changed, that's when I feel close to God. I took a little risk for him. When I take risks in my personal life, my spiritual life, and I pray prayers that only God could answer, whether it's for me emotionally, for me physically, or me spiritually, or something going on in my marriage, or something going on in our home, or something in the church, when I take a big risk for God and I have to spend a few weeks wondering if it's going to work out, that's when I feel close to God. And so the question was, what are you doing right now to take risks for God? This is a risky prayer. God, use me. God, use me. My challenge to you this morning, pray this prayer, mean it, and then allow God to use you in an impressive, incredible, unimaginable way that you never thought possible. I think Nehemiah could kind of see what could happen. I don't think he ever anticipated what happened next. And that's why he started recording verbatim what happened, because he couldn't believe what God was doing. That's what I want for you. I want for you a week from now to be like, man, I started praying, and God started doing, I had to start journaling. I had to start writing down, because there was no way I'd remember all these crazy things God did, and God allowed, and God opened up for me. That's the beauty of following Jesus and saying, God, I think you might be able to, so please use me, use me, use me.